Welcome to Chat with Nomads, where we uncover travel insights, business advice, adventure stories, and lifestyle tips with world travelers and digital nomads. Here is your host, Rax, from nomadsunveiled.com. Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of Chat with Nomads. Today, we have with us Cash, the co-founder of Two Monkeys Travel and Mr. and Mrs. How.com. Hi, Cash. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, Rax. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a bit about yourself and how you started from your journey of a corporate job to basically traveling around the world, then meeting the love of your life, and then to where you are today. Mm-hmm. So my name is Catch, and I'm from the Philippines, and I'm actually, I, I only hold a Philippines passport. And in 2013, I quit my job. I used to work in Kuwait and Iraq for, for almost four years, and my last job was for an oil company. And by the time, I know it is like quarter life crisis, I was like 24, and I was like earning really decent money for my age and for my nationality. And I was like, okay, I can't handle this. And, you know, like, you know, and I've decided to quit my job and then go traveling for six months, like just do sabbatical, you know, like for my savings. But unexpectedly, I've met my husband, who is Jonathan. He's like four years older than me. And that time, he left his architectural job to go backpacking and go on a motorbike trip around Southeast Asia. But his plan was not like six months and going back to the UK. But his plan was like he retrained himself to become an English teacher because he knew that teaching, you know, like teaching English abroad as a British citizen would make him good money. So He was like on a motorbike trip around Southeast Asia and ended up living in Vietnam, Hanoi, Vietnam. And uh, by that time, I was only backpacking and I've decided just to travel like for two, three months. And when I realized, oh, after meeting Jonathan in Laos, Luang Prabang, Laos, we're like, hmm, I really like this guy. Maybe we should meet up again. And so I visited him in Hanoi, Vietnam, where he started teaching English and ended up not leaving. I ended up teaching English there. And uh, we live in Vietnam for seven, to, I think almost nine months. And actually nine months for him, seven months for me. And then we were like, let's do it. We don't have both plans. He was like 29 and I was like 25. I was like, let's just travel the world. So we book our flight tickets to India where we live and travel for three months. And that's where we trained to become yoga teacher and massage therapist because we knew we wanted to keep traveling, but we need to fund our travels. We're, we don't have trust fund or we don't have any uh, stock market money at the time. We didn't have that much money. All the money that we had was like the savings we got after teaching English in Vietnam. And then after that, we flew to South America where we live in uh, Peru, where we were like volunteering in exchange for accommodation and breakfast. And we decided to start our travel blog. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it all started. And a few years later, I've traveled to 144 countries. And together with my husband, it was like around 80 countries because I've traveled solo more than him. Like, uh, especially during the time when we lived on a sailboat for two years. And that was a time when I go out and travel solo for two to three months per year. So Nice, nice. It sounds like yeah, it's, uh, very yeah, it's obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I'm curious about one thing. How do you uh, initially go from like Philippines all the way to Kuwait and Iraq? Like, how do you get a job mm-hmm. there? And why do you even choose to get a job in these countries? Because it's obviously not like a super popular destination for uh, tourism is. or job hunting. Uh, but if you're aware of like Filipinos, we usually go abroad to work and most probably in the Middle East. The reason why I chose Kuwait was because my father has been living there for like 10 years. He works for the Ministry of um, Dental Administration. And um, I was initially, the plan was for me to work for the Philippine Embassy on OJT because my plan is to take up law. Like I finished a degree in economics and my plan was to take up law after my OJT. So I then passed a diplomatic exam so I can become a diplomat. So the plan was for me to be there for three months, work at the embassy, learn how it works. But then I ended up like finding a job um, in the private sector and I was earning really good money for a 20-year-old Filipina. I was like, why would I go back to the Philippines? And then later on, I've learned about couch surfing, backpacking. And because, you know, in the Philippines, you only think when you travel, you'll stay in hotels because that's the only vacation. 
Then when I've learned about these platforms, I was just like, I will never go back to the Philippines and maybe I will not become diplomat because the reason why I wanted to become diplomat is so I could have a diplomatic passport that would let me travel to other countries. And I was like, nah, no need. I could just do couch surfing. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. So basically, wow. you, your life turned out to be very different from what you had initially planned to do, that's, right? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I actually have a lot of questions for you because your life has been so interesting. But one of the main things I wanted to talk to you about was the idea of like the traditional lifestyle, the nine to five, get a good job and then yeah. marry and then, you know, settle down somewhere, right? And although this is like the traditional scope yeah. all around the world, I think in Asia in particular, Asia. it's very prevalent, right? Yeah. Actually, I think our parents' generation is all about like, get a good job, get a stable job, do well in life. And agree, agree. Yeah, and it's interesting because today we see a lot of digital nomads going to Asia to find <laughs> their base. But then, there is actually not much Asian digital nomads per se, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so how do you actually convince your parents about this point? Were they worried in the first mm -hmm. place when you say that you wanted to go travel around the world? And then, mm -hmm. of course, I think there must be some concerns when you start to say, when you're transiting from like a six month sabbatical into like an infinite yeah, travel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, the good thing here is that my parents are separated since I was seven. So I was raised by my mom and I didn't have any close relationship with my father until I was like in university because I had to ask him for allowance and like, you know, like, oh, hey, you haven't provided anything for me. Buy me a car, you know, like that kind of thing. And then after he finished university, he said he offered that, you know, he'll be sending me to law school because like, you know, compared to the Westerners for Asians like us, our parents pay for our tuition fee, you know, but uh, in university, I was scholar. So they didn't really pay anything at all, like um, maybe like hundred uh, dollars for like miscellaneous fees and stuff so my father said that okay if you want to go take up law i will be paying for your tuition fee but and if you didn't get the like, scholarship and stuff but i ended up not doing it so when i arrived in kuwait uh, my father helped me for to go there but then i i've never really grew up with him so like i don't really know him that much and then after my father, I lived with him for a year, I brought my mother from the Philippines to Kuwait. She's also a dentist and she left everything so she could come with me. Oh. And then my mom is pretty cool. And then since we lived together, I moved out from my father's house with my mom. And what I forgot to tell you is like that time I had a boyfriend that is my boyfriend from high school. And I even brought him to Kuwait to live and because oh. she was like... I was earning better money than you and maybe you should come here and you're a nurse. You could be, you know, like you could do something better. And then, but then when I got exposed to the international scene, like meeting new people, like traveling, and it was just like my dream, like, uh, like, you know, be having more, um, uh, like it was just a vision. And then it looks like more reality, meeting more backpackers doing it. I left my boyfriend, uh, like we separated because we had different mindset like he wanted to have family buy a house in the philippines and leave the kids there the grandparents will raise the kids it's just like i never really imagined myself having children anytime soon so i left him and uh, my mom uh my mom raised me to be as independent as i am so when i told her i'm, I'm gonna move to iraq to work i left her in kuwait and i told her she's going to follow but then i left Iraq to go backpacking she never really questioned my decision making because she knew me like she raised me how I am but then after I left my job to go backpacking of course my father who doesn't know who I am like had so many comments and stuff and then I ended up meeting Jonathan and his feedback was like if I have, he even compared me to a cow. Like, um, if the if the farmer got the milk from the cow, why would the farmer buy the cow? Something like that. I don't, I don't remember. But like, he was just like, if this guy is living with you, he's not going to marry you. Like, if you if you just live in with him, you know, like the the old mindset. Yeah. And so he didn't talk to me for years until my blog started to have more attention in some newspapers and stuff and that's and we had more followers then he started talking to me like okay you're not going to be a failure so it's okay like i accepted what you wanted to do but he really literally don't no contact no facebook friends no communication for like three or four years 
but it is quite normal because I didn't talk to him since I was in elementary until college. So, yeah. I see. I see. That's that's tough. But I'm sure your mom. I heard that your mom has been pretty supportive of you because I read one yeah. of your articles about uh, how you started the transition, right? But mm-hmm. I'm sure she's also still like worried that her daughter is going all over the place. Is there anything that you do during your travels that that try to relieve your parents of their concerns? Like, yeah. do you call them every day or something like mm-hmm. that? Um, because the, the cool thing is that at the beginning of my travel, I didn't expect that I'll be meeting Jonathan. So like three months from when I started the adventure and Jonathan and I have been together, my husband, we've been together since 2013 too, until now. So my mom is not really worried because like I always travel with him and we have travel insurance and uh, you know like they are aware of our itinerary they know our schedule and stuff and um, and most recently like i don't even have to call them because they know everything on facebook like we're travel bloggers so everything is heavily documented but if i don't post i inform my mom that of course like i'm sick i couldn't go and the only time that she really got worried was when i had a car accident in pakistan that happened in 2019 and and there's no way and you're already in Thailand waiting for me because I made sure that every year, only just last year, it didn't happen because of COVID, that my mom would go. I'll bring her to a new country with me. So like we'll always have a catch up. But like um, to be honest, like she's not uh, worried too much until like just, just very, very few countries that we go to. But uh, she, thankfully, she doesn't. She knows that I could handle it. And if things happen, and she'd say that she always pray rosary because she's very religious. So, like she said, like God, is, God is guiding you. So I'm not worried about you. So something like that. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Actually, that's nice. Yeah. It's great that like parents support what they all <laughs> want to do, because I also think it's a two way communication, right? When I was young, I also used to be like. Yeah, don't disturb me. I'm just going to go travel and then disappear, right? But then I re- I started to realize that actually it's a bit of a two-way thing, right? Like they support what I want to do and I make sure that I try and communicate with them as often as I can that, hey, don't worry, there's nothing happening. I'm just, you know, going on about my daily life. Now you're in South America. I'll be like, okay, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole COVID situation, of course, still got them like really concerned just because I think <laughs> Asia is one of the continents that right now is dealing with it pretty well, whereas continents like Europe and South America yeah. are not doing so well, right? So they are, yes. they are concerned, but, you know, I think as children, we try and also make them not worry as much. That's probably like our responsibility. <laughs> That's true, that's true, that's true. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about the challenges that you face traveling as a Filipino? Because I know passport is definitely one of the issues that you address a lot and you are now starting to help people with like getting visas and stuff. Mm-hmm. And what other challenges do you foresee or do you see as you travel as a Filipino? What's your passport now? You only have one or? I only have one, the Singapore passport. Which is the strongest in the world. Like you guys can literally <laughs> go anywhere. And then people think like, oh, how come? But like they don't know how strong Singaporeans and no one would question you because like you, you know. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so having a Philippines passport, the hassle part is that applying for visa. Uh, typically for Filipinos like us, it's always hard to get US visa, Canada visa, Schengen, UK. And thankfully, I passed those hurdles. Because like if you're a first-time traveler, what they always say is like you'll not get visa because the the impression that they had is like we are going there to look for work and not go back to the Philippines and you know work illegally with the tourist visa and stuff like that. That that was uh, I don't know history or like just the perception. But I passed that hurdle, and the difficult part now is like the other countries that I plan to visit since I aim to travel to every country in the world is getting a visa to some African countries and some exotic countries, and some of these countries. Uh, like for example, like in in South Sudan or Sudan, it's not just available in all the they don't have embassies in every country in the world. Like in, for you Americans, you know. So like for example, here the the closest is in London or in France. And for me, just to go there, like I have to get a visa to enter France or a visa to enter Lo- UK just to get a visa for me to go to South Sudan. You know. So so there's just so many things that I have to deal with. 
And which is the reason why my husband and I decided to sell our sailboat and move back because we used to live in the Caribbean and to live there, it's not easy going to be easy to travel to other places, which is the reason why we decided to move to Montenegro. There's still no embassies like that here, but like we're able to get residency. And by having residency here, it's easier for me to apply for visas to these countries that we will plan to visit next. And the hassle part is like, as a Filipino, of course, our currency is not that high. I mean, getting visas for a passport is really difficult. And the part, the one hassle part is like, getting those visas are expensive. Hmm. It's like, just to get one uh, American visa, is like $160. To get like, uh, this visa would cost you $60, $100. It's just like, for a Filipino like me, like just to get a visa to go to these countries would cost you loads of money already. Aside from all the requirements that you have to submit, you have to show that you have three to six months bank statement, proof of your income, you know, like a letter why you're going there and a guarantor or like an invitation who is going to host you there. It's just so many requirements. But once you've done one for the others, it's just going to be a little bit more uh, same requirements. But as I've said, for African countries, the complicated part is where will you apply, how long before you could apply, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I really admire you guys as in like the, the greed and determination that you all have to, <laughs> to get the visas, right? Because for me, I'm like, I can't be bothered with visas. Yeah, because the moment I have to do it, I find it a big hassle just because most of the time I don't have to do it, right? I actually met this Indonesian couple in Russia. Okay. Uh, I was there for the World Cup and they were there as well. And they were trying, I think, very hard to get like a Schengen visa because they wanted to go into Western Europe. But it was such a hassle. And then they were staying in St. Petersburg for almost a whole month, just trying to apply and get the documents. Yeah, that's wow. I was like, you guys are just sticking around here for 30 days. Just trying to get the people in and place. And for you, you can just go there. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's true that visa is a big issue for especially people that want to finish all the countries because I, I actually have an episode with a Spaniard that I met that been to all 193 countries. And his main difficulty was actually the, I think he took three years to almost do the last five countries. And one of the main reasons is that he had troubles getting visas to visit some of these remaining few countries. Yeah, two years for five countries. And for us, we could only do visa-free for 65 countries. So imagine. <laughs> It'll take me another 10 years. <laughs> oh, gosh. But you're nearly there. You're nearly there. I think you've been to way more mm-hmm. countries than a lot of people, for sure. It's been a, it's been a long while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's interesting. And so can you debunk some of the myths that that Filipinos often have about long-term travel, right? And it could even be the perceptions that fans, friends and families have back home that they think about long-term travel or they think about, you know, just wandering off in life. Yeah, of course, they, they ask about the safety, like how safe it is. And uh, I, I couldn't answer it because it really depends on the location and the situation. Like, as if you could like avoid like going out at night and you know like those kind of things but of course accidents you cannot control you never know what's gonna happen next so another thing is like how expensive it is like but now i don't have difficulty explaining to family and friends because they were able to follow the journey from the beginning of like volunteering and you know like um, to finally getting sponsors and making money from consulting speaking in conference and later on like uh like one that i want to debunk is just like when someone says for our generation and for us for my fellow Filipinos, when they say, oh, I want to quit my job to go travel around the world, they might think that your career or your life will end immediately from there. But what I was like trying not just to campaign is that you could build a career from traveling and doing something. And that's the big trend of the digital nomads that especially now a lot of people are working from home. So why work from home if you can work from anywhere? So like, or like they might think that we are just traveling and just gullo- like, you know, like drinking everywhere or what, but like I saw someone who tries to make a living while moving, we work most of the time, like 
but the difference is we just keep moving. But as I've said, in 2019, we are no longer, I don't consider myself anymore a digital nomad, but we've been doing it since 2013 to 2019 because we're now more like expats or like um, someone who has permanent pace, but we'll still be traveling. And that part of adventure will never, you know, I will never lose that part of adventure of seven years doing that, uh, almost seven years of doing that. But now, at some point in your life, you just wanted just done with the long term trouble and have and have a home base, which I think you would agree later on. So how many how many years have you been doing this? So I started traveling way more regularly since 2010. So that okay. was when I started going to Mexico and then places that are far from home. And then throughout the years, I've been doing different variation of traveling because I started off in school when I was in university. I did like exchange and stuff. So a bit of like okay. student life and backpacking. And then in the midterm, I became a bit more of like business trips for conferences and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I, I did a bit of expat life as I was doing like a startup company in another country. And nice. I would say almost three, three to four years ago, then I started a bit more of like midterm traveling, stretching a, a longer distance. But I definitely agree with you on what you are saying, whereby a lot of people think that traveling equals to you know, throwing your life away. Like drinking and yeah, yeah, they might think, you know. <laughs> yeah, which is crazy. And and I, I guess it's a bit because also because of what we post on social media, right? Like we we but never you just post, post the highlight of your life. Precisely. <laughs> like we we post the fun part, right? Like you're definitely be posting travel photos. Yeah. You wouldn't be posting yourself like just working on the laptop, right? It doesn't make sense. But uh, I actually personally post those as well. Like I post the, the reality. That's why uh, we have two pages. One is two monkeys where I literally just like, you know, like the best things in life or like the guide on how to teach people. And then we have the Mr. and Miss How page where I just post the everything that I do in a day. Like even if I complain, my health issues, like just the reality. So people would see that this is the reality of life. It's not just like super nice unicorns all the time. <laughs> but if they will compare it to the life in Instagram, then it's totally different because that one is just the highlight of your life. We Sometimes I think, I guess we might even work longer than, especially for digital nomad entrepreneurs, right? Sometimes we still work longer than even office hour. But the whole reality behind even the highlight content is that we are happy with what we are doing. There is genuine happiness there, but you only see the highlights, which is why people keep thinking that, you know, digital nomads are just like, oh, having fun all day long and they're happy yes. with their life. And no career. Yes, agree, agree. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. It's super funny. But I guess, especially now that the trend is picking up, I think some people will start doing it and then they will realize that, hey, this is not actually what I really fully anticipated. Let's agree. I agree with you. I agree with you. Let's talk a bit about your journey to shifting from like just backpacking to ultimately teaching English and then really doing your blog. Because I think travel blogging is another thing that is very often misunderstood by people as a bit of like okay. overnight success, right? People think you just write a few articles and then the blog will take it's off and go crazy. Sponsors and stuff. Yes. Yeah. And thankfully, we got into the travel blogging world in 2014 when I'm not saying it's saturated now because even though there's more and more travel bloggers, there's di like everyone has different personality, different journey, different, you know, like uh, different style. So there's like if you decide to start a, a travel blog to people to, who listens to your shows and stuff, go do it. It's, there's really, you know, like it's not too late. But when we started in 2014, there's not a lot of people doing it and in our niche like a couple like from the philippines and the british or like a filipina quitting the job to travel long term so i was able to to get into that market and um but what people don't know is that i actually wrote it in some articles that we work like 18 hours per day because you have to write content you have to do seo you need to do keyword search you need to put photos, put pinnable pins, and spend a lot more time in promoting it. Because like, even if you keep writing content, uh, who, if you have no readers, then you, there's no profit. And then you have to learn about affiliate marketing, how to get sponsorship, and so, so, and so. And sponsors will only come to you if you have enough readers. You have numbers. You have analytics to promote, uh, you know, to, to prove that, hey, I really have people who follow my blog, and I have click-throughs, and I have a good return of your investment. Like, my ROI is high. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. So, 
Uh, there are like people who do travel blog for hobby, which is just to share it to family and friends. And there are people who do it for business, like what we did. And business is just like, you know, helps us to pay for our trips, help us to buy our house and help us to, to you know, like pay bills that we have. So um, thankfully, because when we started, we didn't know about travel blog. We already started traveling, teaching. We thought that the way we could provide this is like teaching English anywhere or uh, doing yoga, uh, teaching yoga, doing massages, or like trying to buy, you know, um, how can I say it, do e-commerce or anything, stuff stuff like that. Until we got into the travel blog part and then started to do lifestyle blog and, you know, like that kind of thing. And it's not just about blogging because you ended up like, aside from making money from your commissions and stuff, you have to think of your products and services that you could sell to, to support your, exp uh, you know, like to earn extra income. And if you have a good readership or following, then it would come true. Because if you don't have, then of course, who, who would buy your products and your services? So yeah. yeah. And eventually with the travel blog, we also got sponsored by, you know, like airlines, Turkish airlines sponsoring us since 2015 or seven, 2015, 17, you know, like those days. And then hotels, tourism boards. And that's why we're able to stay in nice hotels get get proper tours because if not we would be staying still in backpackers hostel and you know like <laughs> and uh, yeah that's it <laughs> yeah i definitely agree uh on the travel blogging part i was always telling people that if you really want to make money fast right like if you want to make money right off the bat and then start traveling with a sustainable income blogging is probably like the shittiest way to do it because there's so much things that you need to learn and do that the by the time you run a successful blog, right, you can actually offer services in social media marketing, in SEO, because that is how deep you need to learn about all these areas to even succeed on doing a travel blog, right? Mm -hmm. So so that that was really interesting. And that's true. And it's it's fun because I see you guys really move from like the start, which is a bit of like the backpacker style. A bit more of like work away as well because you are you are yes you were yeah helpx right? actually the time we're using helpx not work away because work away ah. you had to pay pay premium that time so we were like doing helpx it's free um actually if you will go to our two monkeys page you can go to our cover photo and then you could go back you will see a photo of a three literally two monkeys. With a backpack, like a brown monkey and a white monkey. Actually, we didn't expect it's going to go bigger. That's why we were like, just for fun. Like, we call each other two monkeys. And eventually, it's a really good recall for brands. So like, okay, we'll work with two monkeys travel. It's easy because like, not, it's not like I'm a nomadic cat or like uh, something like similar with the same names, you know. So uh, if you look at there, it has there. Our goal is like from monkey backpackers to luxury travelers. That was our goal. and. Wow. Law of Attraction works. Like we started it in 2014. We were just monkey backpackers, and our goal is to become luxury travelers with a suitcase. And it all happened. So dreams yeah. do come true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, the, the name is really good. I really like the name, and I think it was very memorable, especially with the logo. The logo was so <laughs> nicely done with like the two monkeys. So cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how long did it actually take you until the blog takes off to become like something more sustainable full time? So actually, we started the blog in 2000 and, um, 2014, and then we, it really took off. Uh, in 2015, okay, but 2014, on the first month that we bought the domain name, we had like a blog spot. And then when we had the domain name, um, around October, we paid for it. Actually, my mom paid for it because we didn't have credit card that time. We were still teaching English that time and stuff. Um, what happened was we ended up writing for Rappler, a big publication in the Philippines. They paid us 50 euro, $50, and that was our first income. And then the agreement was they will give a link back to our brand new website. And we wrote an article that gone crazy viral in, in social media on that website. So we got like an immediate click through on our page. So that was like a good thing. And then that time, uh, Tefl was starting to boom, to boom, and we partnered with the Tefl company because we were writing that. How are you funding this travel? We're not funding it as a travel blogger. We're newbies. We told them that we are teaching English to make money to travel, and we were literally English teachers that time. Actually, I was like improving my English, but like 
uh, in Peru that time, like my English was good. Like <laughs> we were in Arequipa and they, they like it. It's just all business English and presentation and stuff yeah. like that. So uh, by January 2015, because we bought the domain around October, we started the blog spot like March when we were still in India. But like we started content and promoted as a blog spot by June. We bought the domain in October. And by January, we made like $1,000 immediately because we were promoting a TEFL course and we were making commission from it. And it's just because of our first hand experience. And then we've learned like, oh, you could make money from commission. Then we signed up from Agoda, Booking.com, Sky, you know, like those all um, hostel world where you can make money from affiliate marketing. And then once we gathered and get more and more followers in social media, uh, we ended up, um, um, how can you say it, uh, getting more sponsored posts uh, through uh, staying in hotels. And we told them, look, we have uh, 10,000 followers. Can we get a free night stay in a hotel? And they're like, sure. And that time, you know, exchange deal was like, oh, this is a new thing. And well, let's try with you. And yeah. then we do it. And then when you try to reach another company, you told them, look, I work with this five-star hotel before. Maybe we could work together. And then it's just like snow store, you know, like it just continue and continue. And then once you had more higher, like, you know, higher domain authority and high, like, you know, high more numbers of readers, then you could get more sponsorship, advertising and stuff like that. Oh, that's so cool. Technically, we bought the website domain in September, October. We made money properly by January 2015. But you need to maintain the momentum. It's not like you just made money and then you're done. You need to make sure that you are consistent and it's all keep going and going. And you just have to be diverse and diverse and diverse. So. Yeah, that's really cool because it's really considered quite fast to be able to to like yeah. you know, make it into a more sustainable business by six months to a year. I think that's very mm -hmm. good in, in terms of like blogging. And basically, at the beginning too, when we didn't learn that much, we had some volunteer writers. Like, uh, why volunteer? We couldn't afford to pay for them. But then they got a free trip to Iceland or free trip to Morocco. Like, they get like exchange deal. We send them on trips. But they don't. we don't oh. pay them. And so we got more content. Oh, that's interesting. That's that's a new model I've not heard. So basically, you guys got a press trip, but then you don't go for the press trip. Instead, you send someone else to go for it. Yes, and because we were like that country. time in Peru and we can't just go and fly to Iceland. So we get someone to do it and wow. we can't pay them, but they get free trips. So it's like another extra thousand trips. But uh, it didn't work out eventually. So we only had that for one, two years because, you know, when you start making money, people want to get paid as well. But then the maintenance of the website is what they don't know behind the scene, you know, like yeah. the domain and the, the advertising and, the, you know, like and stuff like that. But then it gets uh, too much. So now we have uh, full time. We don't have volunteer writers. We have we have six full time staff now working with us who manages some of our websites and helping us with our social media and editing and stuff like that. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a new model that I've heard you guys try. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that later on. We could uh, discuss it, how you could get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see you guys testing and trying a lot of stuff. As I, I guess that's the interesting part about blogging is mm -hmm. that there is so many things you can do, but you have limited time. So you always pick and choose what to try. That's I think true. part of experimenting is where the fun fun of the whole business is. Well. Yeah. And I'm interested to really know about life on a sailboat because that is in the last few years, two to three years of your life. So uh, actually, we've been traveling so for 2013 to 2017, but um, I enjoy it. But my husband, after we got married in 2016, he, he really wanted to have a boat. He actually had that idea when we were got engaged in 2015 to sail from San Blas Islands from Panama to Colombia through the San Blas. Oh. And we were like on a boat and he was just like, I really wanted to buy the boat. But we're like, we have $800 and you have overdraft. Like we have debts. We don't have credit cards. So we had overdraft on his uh, Barclays card in the UK. I was like, so how can you buy a boat? Like $800. And we were like broke. <laughs> but then he was just like, no like law of attraction he was just like doing that and 2017 we're able to buy a sailboat because he said he's semi-retired he's done because that time we're making passive income and you know passive income is not totally passive you need to work still to, to make money from it so we bought that boat uh, in florida keys 
in the, um, May 2017. And we had an agreement because like sailing is not my thing. And Jonathan only learned how to sail in Turkey for five days and he wanted to captain his boat. I was like, okay, I, I cannot negate what he wanted because he's been very supportive with my dreams. And I was just like, sure, you can do that. But I was just like, how can you do that? But he can do that. And then that time, the boat that we bought is like 1971. Like it was built in 1971. So it's a really old um, Finro sailboat made in Finland, but it's sturdy and strong. And we ended up like I told him, okay, you fix the boat. I'm going to Africa. I traveled to 17 countries in of Africa for almost three months. And then I went on a Caribbean sailing uh, cruise with my mother. And then I returned home. I was like, okay, Jonathan, is the boat ready? Because he had to fix everything and stuff. And I don't want to be there on the construction part. I was like, okay, the boat is ready. We are going to the Bahamas. But then two weeks after I arrived, Florida Keys was hit by Hurricane Irma. Oh. Oh, okay, and okay. In, I don't know if you've heard that hurricane. It's crazy. Yep, a yep. lot of damage in Florida Keys, and we were in Marathon, Florida Keys, and in the marina where we were, uh, like there were like three hundred boats, but only fifty boats survived. Some of them sunk. Some of them like totally damaged. You know, because the hurricane went. The eye of the hurricane was there, and thankfully our boat was still in the mooring. But with damaged window, damaged stanchions, and it was just like unbelievable. Like because the mooring field has a line, and on that line, it's only our boat remaining there. And he was wow. just like, I really don't understand. I do believe in miracle, but my husband said like he's been like visualizing it being protected by a bubble and stuff like that. But still, we had minor damages. But we were so worried because at the time our boat was not insured and a big chunk of our money was there because we only, you know, we bought it from our blogging income and we put all in and we didn't have much, you know. And I was just like, if we lost that, all of our savings is gone. It's just a lesson learned, but a shattered dream for Jonathan. But no, he visualized it's protected. But it still took us two months to fix it. And we left to go three or four months to fix it. So it's like really ready to go and not going to sink. And by February, we took off with a cat that we 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 yeah, we we adopted in Florida Keys who survived a hurricane, the hurricane. So the two of us with our cat, Captain Ahab from Moby Dick, sailed to Bahamas, and we didn't know how to sail. I don't know anything about sailing, so thankfully we just followed the cruise ship. Uh, you know, like doing the troubled water. I actually have a link. You should read it. We, we thought we were all going to die. And we arrived in the Bahamas 30 hours later. First time sailing on our boat, on just on our own with the cat. And uh, two years later, we sailed from the Bahamas all over the Bahamas, not all over, but south of the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, Dominican Republic, until Puerto Rico, until we decided we sell the boat and move back to Europe. So, Wow, that's and interesting. It, it was amazing and that's the reason why we started the Mr. and Mrs. House Sailing blog because we, even though the Two Monkeys Travel took a hit for two years because our tra- our pe- the people who traveled, uh, followed our journey was mostly like uh, adventuring with the backpacking, volunteering and my adventures as a Philippines passport and not a lot could, could relate with living on a sailboat. Of course, not everyone wants to live on a boat or wanted to buy a boat or whatsoever. So our follower count like got affected but we ended up having a different kind of followers through mr and Ms. how followed the sailing adventure so. ah that's why you started like a second block because you wanted to kind yeah. of segment the, the yes. target audience basically yes ah okay okay but so jonathan you guys sail off with his five days of skill that he learned in turkey and then that's all he didn't take any more courses after that yeah. He got his Raya certificate, so you just get your ROA that you are a day skipper, not even licensed. That's what we learned that in America you could sail your boat without a license. Like you could you couldn't drive a car without a license, right? Yeah. But in America, as long as you are insured and like like your your boat and the people in the boat is insured, you could sail the boat. But you mm-hmm. can that you own. But not like a chartered boat that you read. They will not allow you. But like okay, if you okay. own it and you have insurance and you are like that, then it's good. So because during the hurricane, we didn't have insurance because no one would insure a broken boat that time. It's not finished. So that's why it took us for months to, to, to fix it so we could get it insured. And then when we got insured, 
we left. <laughs> ah, nice. And what, what's the pros and cons of life on a sailboat? What do you like about it? Um, and what do you do? We, you know, we you had know. a monohull. If we had a catamaran, I'd really enjoyed it. But to be honest, like people would assume the reason why we le- left the boat is because I didn't like it, but it's my husband who stopped it. Okay. I really love the, the sailing life. At the beginning, I didn't like it. I was just like, oh my God, because we didn't have proper shower in the boat. And Jonathan was like putting, giving me like a portable shower. And then a few months before we sold our boat, when we realized that we really have a shower that is hidden under <laughs> all of the schools, I was just like, where we're selling the boat and just we've learned it. So like you don't have proper shower. The space is tiny. Of course, the Caribbean is really hot. And uh, it's just like the cons thing. Like it's just a tiny. And for you to go to land, you have to drive your little little uh, rubber boat, your yeah. dinghy to go to land and stuff like that. But we ended up staying in mostly in marinas. So we could, but end up like we're staying on our boat on a shared bathroom with other people so I could shower properly. Just like, well, we're like backpacking, but we have our house that we're dragging along with us. But the, the pros is like, you have the freedom. Like you can go to islands where no one is there. And the community, the community of sailors are amazing because most of them are retired and a lot of people are just like chasing freedom. So it's just amazing, amazing um, community to be in. We've met amazing, wonderful friends through sailing. And and of course, uh, it's just the adventure. Like you never know what's going to happen. Are you going to die tomorrow or not? So something like that. <laughs> yeah, but for imagine. the captain, he's the skipper. So I think he's always pressured that our, is our, our, our boat going to sink today? Is the water going to in? Because it's all the time in the water. You have to make sure there's no water coming in. So maybe the, the pressure is on for him. For me, the only worry I have is like, what are we going to eat tonight? So like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess the maintenance is always an issue, right? Expensive, the maintenance, yeah. <laughs> and why do you guys ultimately decide to settle down in Montenegro? Because I, I've been there and I, I kind of like it. I especially like Koto. And yeah. I also do see a lot of investment opportunities in Montenegro. But... <laughs> Then again, it's not like an obvious choice for a lot of people, right? So what what drew you guys to actually decide on Montenegro? So when we actually sold our boat, our plan is to really move to Europe, not the not UK, because like we we that we have a an, uh, a lifestyle that we wanted, and we couldn't afford that in the UK. You know, we want to eat out, we want to go sailing, we want to go travel. We like we want a luxury lifestyle on the budget. We thought of moving to Portugal and Spain, which is feasible because, you know, he's during the time it wasn't Brexit. So he still, we could get residency, buy a property. Or what. But then we got invited to go back to Montenegro. Uh, we were, I've visited Montenegro twice prior to moving in 2019. And we really love it because we love sailing and we want to buy another boat and we could go sailing in Boca. Mm. And Jonathan loves motorbikes. And Montenegro is popular for all of the motorbike routes and cycling routes. And the country is tiny and getting a residency for Filipinos like me, because I got the residency before Jonathan. Like he was like, oh, I don't need it. I could easily enter. I'm British. And I was like, I need it because if I don't get, I can only stay 30 days with my US pa- USA visa on my Philippines passport. So I got my residency before him. And he eventually just decided to get a residency that through our company and the property because the time when the covid happened he was stuck in the uk he couldn't come back come in because he's not a resident I'm like, mm. he's not you're, you're british but you can't enter so i was just like mm, i'm filipino with the residency and i could enter so uh, of all the places the cost of living in montenegro is still cheap you've been here so you know and the opportunity here to start something new and the lifestyle is so laid back. It feels like you're in the Caribbean because the people, you know, the people are so chilled, super nice, super approachable. And you'll find fresh food, like because everyone, almost everyone has their own garden, fresh veggies almost every day, fresh meat, you know, like uh, and stuff. And the cost of living, if you have 500 euro, because we're not renting a house, you're fine. Like you'll survive. If you have 1,000, 1,500 euro, you're rich. You know, mm-hmm. like like every meal you might have alcohol and you, you are eating steak or like you're eating seafood all the time. And and the location is strategic. We live in Herzegnovi. We are so close to three different airports. We could just cross the border to Dubrovnik and we could fly anywhere. 
there's right. EasyJet, Ryanair, and stuff. And we travel a lot. So we plan to make Montenegro as our home base. And buying a house was not our plan. Our plan was just to rent for a year. We ended up buying a house because uh, I had a car accident and I couldn't walk for a few months. Oh. And we, we were renting. We were renting in a penthouse without an elevator. So I was just like, well, even if I go to therapy, I can't really go up and down of this place. So Jonathan decided to look and look. And we had enough savings that we've been saving for for years. And we're like, oh, let's buy a house. And then COVID happened. And she's like, we can't go. Let's renovate our house. So <laughs> Nice. And, and this is the you house. Come back. I, you should come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going back because that time I didn't really spend a lot of time over there because I was traveling with another friend that is that is on my a schedule so I, oh. I, you know, I was just tagging along but i really love the coast of montenegro i think there's a lot of untouched stuff there and, and but it's just like <laughs> very developed now by resorts and stuff and that part i kind of don't like it as much just because yeah. it's getting so commercialized i haven't been to the area that you guys are in is that like still very cultural in Novi, so if you came from kotor we are this town that close the border to to Dubrovnik. So when you're about to cross the border to Dubrovnik, this is the town where we live in. Ah, okay, okay. okay. Croatia. Before you cross the Croatia, this is it. Ah, okay. Because I didn't go that way. I came in through Bosnia. And then ah, I left, okay. That's why you did other time. Yeah, and then uh, I left by Albania. So I we'll talk later. <laughs> tell, tell me and we'll show you around and you might end up buying a small house with a big land and you'll just like grow all of your vegetables and stuff. But like for someone like us, like we, my husband and I really couldn't live in cities anymore. We are really prefer to drive or and so now we live near the city, but we're still up in the hills surrounded by mountains and, uh, you know, like w- w- with trees and animals because we have cats so we can't live in the city and our cats are just happy to run around the village and we don't have neighbors we actually have a, a few neighbors but they don't live here it's just their sum, sum, um, summer home so when people like learn that we live in the top of the hill of this little town and they, we have like six cats we actually arrived with two cats like one cat we adopted from florida and another cat from dominican republic and ended up adopting in florida in montenegro and then they've learned that we have cats we live up in the mountain and we've traveled around the world and we lived here and they're like you know because montenegro and the, the village uh, the, the city is like a tiny thing people talk and i'm like who are these weirdos like who are these until they meet us they'll be like oh you guys don't look weird but how come you live there with many cats? <laughs> it's just so funny. Yeah, six cats. That's a lot. That's like the typical mm, crazy COVID. cat lady. <laughs> this is what COVID do to you if you're not traveling. You just keep getting people to, to take care of. <laughs> oh, gosh. And, and so what, what are you guys' plans after this? Like, are, you, are you looking to go to other countries? or? Now, I actually brought my brother. So this is what the reason why I really want to move to Montenegro is like, so I could easily bring my families here. Because like, you know, if I immigrated to UK, it's not easy to bring my family there, like, or friends who wanted to immigrate and stuff. So we started the company and we are the only licensed uh, company in Montenegro who caters to Filipinos and maybe other Asian nationalities who needed a type B visa to immigrate to Montenegro. It's just like how people promote to immigrate to Canada or immigrate to... But like we're targeting more business investors because job opportunities here are not really high because as you know, country is tiny, 600,000 population, not a lot of businesses. So, but it's going to boom when it becomes EU and stuff like that. So our plan is to settle down get our company sorted, bring our stuff here. And my brother is here. So we, we just came back from Moldova where we spent a week for work. Mm-hmm. And my brother looked after our cats. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have a big plan to go to Africa, which is uh, my big continent that I haven't really visited. And we're traveling on an overland track. And that's our big goal. And I, I still aim to travel to every country in the world in the next two or three years. And then maybe after that, adopt more cats and have a sanctuary. I'm just saying. <laughs> just- That's nice. That's nice. So you guys are really getting into Montenegro kind of say early, right? Because now I think, and, and this is like the best time to go in when it's still early before the boom. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So imagine when Croatia before like 10, 15, 15, 20 years ago. People yep. were just like buying properties there and it's so easy because Croatia was not EU. 
now it's not easy to get into yeah. Asia. Like even for tourism, it's not just easy for Asian people to buy properties there or to get a residency visa there. So, and what's next to Croatia? It's Montenegro and Montenegro is really trying to be EU too. So we're like, if we decided to move to Portugal or Spain, it's already systematized and everything. And here you could do and be somebody. You could start something as long as you have ideas and visions and capital to start with. And and now Montenegro as well has a, they just passed a law that for any startup companies who would start here in Montenegro, it's going to be tax free for you, income and corporate for five years. Oh, so this is the best time to get into it because they're really trying to make it like a hub, like you know what Bucharest, Romania did for their, you know, like for the IT sector. So that's what they are trying to push now to bring more digital nomads in Montenegro, not just to invest in properties, but this is where they could have their uh, to start a startup company. Mm, yeah, Five that's the so. that's the vibe I got when I was in Montenegro as well. So is yeah. it is it actually easy to buy a property as a foreigner in yeah. Montenegro? Ah. And unlike in other countries, you own your property hundred percent. Like you know, for foreigners to in the Philippines, you can only buy condominium and you cannot buy a land yeah. because it's only for local here 100 percent, we have a, a house and lot that is named 50 50 with me and my husband just have to make Ooh. sure it's 50 50 <laughs> but like, <laughs> you like you can own it 100 percent with you so and there are properties like because the thing is there's no standard rate for our properties in montenegro it's because um they don't have like a systematized real estate you know like standard because here for people here, it's just like, it depends on how much you want to pay. Like, there's like a property boom in 2006 and seven when it became a country, you know, it's a new country where all the Russians arrive here and just paid cash just to buy everything because no one is checking where is their cash coming from. So now it's a little bit stricter. But now, because they, the locals, they know that um, Montenegro is going to be EU. So they're like, there's no rush for them to sell because when it comes to you, they yeah. will, you know, have more value. So now, because of COVID, a lot of Russians who bought the property in 2006 and 77 are now selling their properties for cheaper because they wanted mm. cash. Oh, So that's why you don't know when is the best time to buy or sell because for us, uh, our property was double. But we were able to buy it half what what the Russian guy was asking because he just wanted cash and we had the cash and we got it. So yes. oh, so it's fully paid off. Like you guys literally paid off the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, because there's no um, the only issue here is like it's cheaper to buy in Montenegro, but there's no mortgage here. You pay everything uh, in cash. Okay, okay. So and are the papers in English or are the papers in like the official language? In Serbian, but you need to get like a lawyer and like a court appointed uh, court appointed translator. You cannot, the only thing here in Montenegro is for foreigners, you cannot do anything document wise without a court appointed translator. Um, you could find anyone like that is has a stamp and we know someone who deals with everything because it's for your protection. You don't want to sign something you don't understand. Yeah, for sure. So it's a requirement by law that you have that. And we actually saw the house in Monday. Actually we saw the house. We've been looking for house three weeks for three weeks. And we saw the house on Monday. We put an offer on Tuesday. The Russian guy flew from Moscow by Thursday. So Wednesday we had to put down payment. To, with the truck with the with the agency with the real estate agency and the russian arrived on thursday here we check everything in the house friday we signed the contract transferred the money from the uk to montenegro we couldn't transfer the money to russia because um uh there's like a i think blockage something like oh, okay. that so we had to transfer okay, the money from the UK to montenegro and the montenegro bank transferred it to him to russia and on saturday we met the owner, the previous owner. We flew at the same time in the same airport because we're going to Bhutan and he's going back to Moscow. And when we get back from Bhutan, uh, our trip, the, the house is transferred under our name. <laughs> That's crazy fast for a yeah. house purchase. <laughs> Like but to be honest, it's not usually easy for others because, of course, you have to do your due diligence, you know. Like, you have to make sure the title is clean, that there's only one owner. Because the only problem buying with the local is that even if they sell it to you, then if you see that the cadastre document, that the title is like 10 owners, you cannot. And you yeah. pay the only one, and then how about the nine others? So that's the best thing of buying from another foreigner because it makes sure 
that they clean, make sure the title is clean. So thankfully oh. for us, there's only one owner. And now we've been seeing more and more in the market because my husband has been getting into it. We're not into real estate, but we're just helping some people and, you know, like get commission from the owner themselves. We just connect you to them. But because uh, now so many Russians trying to sell properties that they bought 10, 12 years ago, and it's just getting cheaper. I don't know yes, how long it could cheap. last. So, now I know Now I know who to go to if I want to look into yeah, it. Yeah. You know, come over, just see it yourself and like <laughs> drive around and see, oh, for sale. Yeah, it seems, like a, seems like a good time to do it, actually. <laughs> and, you know, to be honest, it's just like, it looks so complicated for someone who really didn't live abroad, but for us, like who lived abroad, you just know, you know, ways and stuff, and it's just like, it sounds normal, but you just have to really do do due diligence. Like we had friends who were able to check things for us in the you know like in the uh, in the title office and stuff. So ah, we knew nice. lawyers, we knew we knew people. So it's just it became, it looks it sounds easy. <laughs> cool, cool. What advice would you give to Filipinos or Asians or Southeast Asians who are you know who want to get into like long term travel yeah. and this kind of lifestyle, but then they are all, of course worried about convincing their family. They are worried about the stability of life and stuff like that. What would be your best advice for them? For me, it's just like get out there, get out of your comfort zone. People, your parents will definitely worry about you because mm, if they don't, are they psychopaths? Or, you know, like uh, they should worry. But the way, the best rebuttal is like, but you raised me. You raised me to be independent, right? So why won't you allow me? So it means your upbringing, your, the way you, up, you know, like brought me up is not the best way. So that's maybe how you could do a rebuttal with your family. But to be honest, before you get into the long-term travel, you need to make sure quitting your job, leaving, get started is easy. The hard part is sustaining it. How can you sustain a lifestyle like this? So my, my tip for you is to learn and learn and new skills so you could work online. They start being a virtual assistant or like trade or do anything that would make you money to make the lifestyle su sustainable. Because what you don't want to happen is after you get exposed in the real world, not real world, but like in this world, and then you run out of money is to go back home and get back to your old job, get back to the old thing, because you're no, go, no longer going to be your old self anymore. This is going to be an easy for you. This is going to be sad or makes you depressed. So what you want to do is don't just quit for the sake of getting started and getting out of your comfort zone, but quit with a plan of how you could sustain the lifestyle. Like I always say to my my to, to our readers, like YOLO, you only live once, but you need to think long term. But of course you never know when you're gonna die, but you need to always think what's next, what's next, but enjoy the moment, but you are ready at least like six months ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love that perspective because I always see we have been talking so much about how the older generations are so outdated and always thinking about like, oh, we have to save money, blah, blah, blah. And then now the newer generation's problem is always all YOLO, right? Like everything, let's just do it. And then they don't care about the practical side of it. I think one good thing about being our generation or in the middle kind of thing is that we get both sides. Like we are, we are practical in the sense that we know that, hey, let's have some savings and let's, you know, be prepared for the future. But then we, we still enjoy our life, you know? I agree. I agree with you. And like savings would last you for weeks and stuff like, you know, like months or what. Emergency fund could help you. But sustaining it longer than that, it's a different story. So you yep. need to have other sources of income. Cool, cool. Thank you for coming on today, Catch. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Chat with Nomads. Please remember to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to share with your friends. Also, we'd love to know what topics you'd like to hear more about. To stay updated on the latest, join us on our mailing list at chatwithnomads.com. You can also find more travel and nomading tips at Nomads Unveiled. That's N-O-M-A-D-S-U-N-V-E-I-L-E-D.com. Start living your dreams today. We'll catch you in the next episode.